two speakers today to address those two different um, subject areas. Erin Wilson is with the Bird Polar Center here at Ohio State University, and he works with Ohio State Extension. He's one of our weather and climate specialists. And then our spe second speaker is going to be Jared Schaefer with the Ohio Department of Agriculture. He works with the Ohio Sensitive Crop Registry. And just recently, um, they started working with Field Watch, which is a regional sensitive crop registry. And so we have a lot of new things that we have available through it. And he's going to walk everyone through what they need to know. Because on the new dicamba um, labels, you are required to show that you visited a sensitive crop site and you've taken note of where the sensitive crops are in the area around where you're going to be doing the spring. So hopefully after the workshop today, you'll um, have a lot of information. If you have folks that weren't able to make it today, we are recording this, and so we'll have it available for people to watch um, because this is a very important subject that we want to make sure that we um, get out to everyone. So I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Aaron Wilson, again, is with the Bird Polar uh, Research Center here at Ohio State University. And so he's tackled the tough, tough subject of inversions. So Aaron, we'll let you get set up. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so good morning and uh, thanks, um, obviously, to Cindy for bringing me out to speak with you folks this morning. Um, I felt a cold coming on a few days ago and I've been just chugging the vitamin C to try to take care of that. So if my voice flakes a little bit, I apologize ahead of time. So yeah, so I'm here today to kind of share some information about inversions, uh, understanding inversions and weather conditions. As a atmospheric scientist, meteorologist, climatologist, inversions are awesome. They're these, just this awesome phenomenon that happens in the atmosphere. And the process I think is very interesting and I'm gonna step through that uh, today as we go along here. So how many are ready for winter to be done, <laughs> right? Uh, I saw the juncos, for those that follow the birds, the juncos are still here, so they're still hanging on. Uh, but certainly, you know, by Friday, we're gonna start feeling a little bit better. Although I have a feeling it's, it's rather short term this time around, right? It is April after all. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. I pulled, pulled out of my driveway, pulled around the corner this morning, looked across this empty field and voila, right? We had a lot of frost. We had some low-lying low uh, fog here. The sun was just coming up ab above the horizon. And certainly with the clear skies we had last night, we had strong inversion across the region, right? So we had, we had uh, the conditions here. So let's, obviously this has become a topic uh, that has been in the mainstream news and been in many news sites. Obviously, Drift is not a new problem, as you guys are intimately aware, and you're aware of that. It's not a new problem, but certainly with uh, formulas and, and new products and things, it has become a topic of discussion. And, and so the inversions really today, my goals are uh, that hopefully you walk away with a better sense of what understanding of what temperature inversions are, and the specific ones we're talking about are those that are close to the ground. Uh, what are the weather conditions that can lead to off-target drift? across Ohio. Let's look at some of the wind and the temperature characteristics. And then what are some of the common weather scenarios that you might see on a map in the morning, a weather map that you see and say, you know what, this is a scenario that might lend itself to an inversion tonight, right? Okay. If you don't have the direct measurements to be able to take temperatures at different heights, what are some of the things that you can walk away from that'll help you identify uh, what's going on? So kind of broken down into three parts. Uh, I want to start with some basic information about the atmosphere and temperature inversions. Yeah, so we're going to talk about the atmosphere, how it's structured. That, that's going to help us uh, kind of get in, into the um, topic a little bit. Basic forms of heat transfer, right? This is very important when it comes to temperature inversions. What are the inversions? And then thanks to uh, the assistant state climatologist, Jim DeGrand, who's actually in the back of the room here, uh, and some data that he, he and his class um, collected at the turf grass here at Waterman Farm, we can look at an example of that and how the temperatures change throughout the course of an inversion and non-inversion period. Uh, th then I'm going to share some analysis of data that I collected um, or, or essentially downloaded and did some analysis on historical wind conditions by hour to kind of help frame some larger management decisions, you know, in terms of what are the windows of possibility uh, that will help your, your management here. And then again, review those conditions so you walk away with a good sense of what to look for uh, for these temperature inversions. 
All right, so the atmosphere and temperature trends. So this atmosphere, you know, we talk about it, we sort of take it for granted. It's this thin gaseous layer of air that surrounds the Earth, protects us from the sun's heat and radiation, right? And basically, because we've got imbalances of primarily heat, but also moisture and pressure, uh, there's a lot of energy exchanges that take place between the atmosphere and the surface, and, and, and all of those effects that are produced are what we call weather, right? Those are the, the what, we, what we term weather, all of those effects of trying to balance out the heat, and moisture, and pressure across the surface. Now, the atmospheric structure, uh, we break it up into different levels, right? Uh, we live down here in what's called the troposphere. This is the bottom level, but you've got the troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, thermosphere, and on up, right? So if you think about the, the atmosphere or the, the air, you know, the makeup, right? Half of the atmosphere lies below about three and a half miles. Okay, so the important thing about the atmosphere, uh, you can see this red line here on, on, on the right-hand side of the figure. Uh, this is the typical temperature profile throughout the atmosphere. So in the troposphere where, you know, the weather exists and we live, typically temperatures cool with height up to the stratosphere, about 25 kilometers off the surface. And then they warm with height because we've got ozone that's sitting here in the stratosphere that, that absorbs the, the solar radiation, right? And so that is the inversion, you know, typical inversion layer in the atmosphere is up here in the stratosphere. But here where we live, most of the time, we talk about temperatures cooling with height, okay, on a broad scale. But importantly, we're not talking about the broad scale when we talk about these ground level uh, temperature inversions. Now, when we talk about heat and temperature and the transfer of such, heat really refers to the total kinetic energy, right? Energy of motion of all the atoms and molecules, whereas the temperature is the measure of the average kinetic energy, right? So if I were to ask you a question, what has more heat, a cup of boiling water or Indian Lake with lukewarm water, right? The answer would be the lake because of the mass. There's more molecules, the total heat energy in that system is higher than that hot mug of water. And that's important to remember because heat always moves from a higher temperature body to a cooler one, right? And that's a, a big function of the temperature inversions that we're gonna be talking about. Now, I know you could go all the way back to, to grade school here and you're talking about heat and energy transfer. You could think about a boiling pot, right? So first we have conduction of heat. That's the transfer of heat through molecular activity. So you got hot water here and through molecular activity, you conduct heat into the handle and you have that hot handle, right? Convection is the transfer of heat by movement. So, so as the, the temperatures warm, uh, the warm water rises, right? And cooler air or cooler water replaces that and then warms and you get convection cells, these circulation cells. And the last one is the radiation, right? So this is, this is electromagnetic energy, right? That's heating, transfer of these electromagnetic waves um, in, into, that, you know, into that substance. And so all three are at play when we talk about heat transfer in the atmosphere, okay? This is a picture of the kind of broad scale look at how heat is transferred throughout the atmosphere. We have the sun and we have the solar radiation coming in. So that's electromagnetic waves. They come in and they hit the surface of the earth. And then the surface of the earth absorbs those electromagnetic waves, okay, and heat up, right? The temperature starts to warm. And then through conduction, air near the ground, right, air that's really close to the ground is warmed through conduction of the molecular activity between the surface of the ground and the atmosphere or the air right above it, okay? When you, when you start warming the air, it becomes warm, it's warm, it's less dense, it starts to rise. And as it rises, cooler air circulates down below. And you get these convection cells that grow, typically. This is when you've got you know, strong convection, you get these strong cumulus clouds across the, the region, but you have that convection going on. And the other transfer between the surface and above is through, through radiation. It's infrared or terrestrial radiation longer wave radiation that's being emitted from the surface into the atmosphere. And that gets us down, when we're talking about close to the ground here, say 20 or 30 feet, we're talking about microclimate, a climate, the climate near the ground. That's where these inversions that we're concerned with exist. 
And within that microclimate, you, have, you can have very rapid changes in, in air temperature and wind and humidity over very short distances and periods of time, right? And the air temperatures above that surface in the microclimate are really dependent, uh, dependent upon uh, the surface conditions. The temperature of that surface, the moisture availability in that surface. And this is how heat is transferred throughout the atmosphere. So now we're going to go on a little journey here. We're going to look at temperatures and that air surface exchange within the microclimate on a day where you've got clear skies and little to no wind, okay? So as I mentioned before, you've got the solar radiation that, that's coming in, it's striking the surface, and it's being absorbed by that surface. And when I mean surface, I mean the ground surface, right? Not the, not the layer of air above it, but the ground surface. And that ground surface, as it absorbs the solar radiation, the temperature increases. And again, through conduction, right, that heat is transferred from that hotter body at the surface to the cooler bodies that surround it. The cooler soil below, so you get energy going down into the surface of the soil, or through the surface going into depth at, uh, in, in the soil. And then the air molecules above that surface start to warm through conduction as well. And that activity is going to increase and increase as the sun gets higher and higher in the sky, and those angles become more perpendicular to the surface, right? More of that energy is going directly uh, into the surface there. And as I mentioned before, because of that conduction between the soil surface and the air above, that air is now heated and it expands. And it starts to expand, it becomes less dense, and when things become less dense, they're gonna rise, right? That air starts to rise. And as it rises, cooler, denser air will come down to replace it and sink. And eventually you get these tiny little circulation cells that are existing close to the surface where warm air is rising and cooler air is sinking down and, and you're, you're getting these little circulation or that convection that will slowly warm that thin layer of air close to the surface, okay? Now, as the sun intensity continues to grow, so do the circulation cells. And this is an, a, a few hours after sunrise. This graph is showing temperature here on the x-axis, height on the y-axis here. And essentially, you've got your warmest temperatures at the surface where that radiation is being absorbed and then heat the air close to it. And then you cool with height, right? So that greatest near the surface decreases with increasing height but that largest temperature change is occurring closest to the surface. If this, is, if this continues throughout the day, you know, energy is transferred to greater and greater heights, and you'll see these puffy cumulus clouds develop, right? Puffy cumulus clouds develop, right? So the puffy cumulus clouds, they develop once that air becomes saturated, condenses into the clouds at the tops of these columns of warm air. So this is what you would, you would typically see uh, in conditions like that, right? Now, what, what about the atmospheric role here, okay? So a little bit more of the details. Solar radiation is short wave, high frequency, right? Uh, short wave, by its, by its name, short waves. Mostly visible light comes into the atmosphere, uh, strikes the Earth's surface, gets absorbed, absorbed at the Earth's surface, and then emitted as long wave radiation, right? So the Earth absorbs the solar radiation and then emits this long wave radiation. Uh, we have these awesome greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, uh, predominantly water vapor and carbon dioxide, okay? As that long wave radiation is emitted from the surface, those particles absorb that radiation, right? The visible light is not absorbed by these particles, we call it the atmospheric window, but they, get, they absorb that long wave radiation and then that radiation gets emitted back toward the surface, right? So that's the atmosphere role. Even on clear days, the atmosphere has a role in heating the surface by sending emitted radiation back down toward the surface. If we didn't have the greenhouse gases, our atmosphere would be about 60 degrees uh, uh, cooler than we are now, right? Because it's absorbing that long ray radiation. It's about 40 degrees for water vapor, about 20 degrees for the carbon dioxide that we have in the atmosphere. Now, as this continues to happen, right, we get the maximum surface temperature at, at the ground level occurs when that solar radiation and the atmospheric radiation coming from the water vapor and the carbon dioxide 
equal the loss or the emission of the terrestrial or the ground level. Once that occurs, it's usually about two to four hours after solar noon, then our, our maximum temperatures occur shortly after that as well, right? So this is, this is when we get our maximum solar and atmospheric radiation equal to the terrestrial loss. That's when we get our high temperature for the day, okay? Or, or sorry, shortly after that's when we, when we see our high temperature. <clears throat> okay, so now we're into the late afternoon and evening. We've got clear skies out, right? So Earth's, the surface temperature at the top of the soil, as, the sun, as soon as the sun starts going down, what does it do? The surface starts to cool. And it starts to cool because there is less and less solar radiation coming in, striking that surface. And all of a sudden now, that surface is emitting more terrestrial radiation than it's receiving from the sun or the atmosphere. So that surface is cooling. And soon the surface will be cooler than the adjacent air right above it. Okay? Now, what did I say about, about heat moving from what? A warmer temperature to a cooler temperature. Once that surface is cooler, then that warm air just above it, that heat starts moving, right, is conducted into the cooler surface soil. So the atmosphere is now moving heat, their heat is moving from that thin layer of air right above the surface into the ground soil, okay? Uh, but why does, if it's receiving heat from the atmosphere, why, is it, why does it continue to cool? Well, the surface is still emitting, right, a lot more terrestrial radiation then it receives from the atmosphere and what's also conducted from the deeper soil. Because in the soil, what's happened all day is that, that warmer air is being conducted down at depth. Now that the surface is cooler, the soil's starting to transfer through conduction heat to the surface as well. But because so much terrestrial radiation is being emitted from the surface, then the surface will continue to cool. As it does continue to cool, right? More and more heat from that adjacent air above it will move toward the surface. And eventually what happens is that air right next to the surface of the, the soil surface will be cooler and more dense than the air right above it. And when that happens, then you've initiated your temperature inversion, right? Because you've got a cooler air temperature closer to the surface than you do a loft. And that's opposite of the typical pattern of cooling with height. Now you've got warming with height, and that's the temperature inversion, right? So that's forming during late afternoon. So more energy is conducted from the nearby air to the soil surface, and it continues to be lost through emission of the long wave radiation from the surface. And this is what the temperature profile would look like by late afternoon into the evening, okay? So you've got your temperature, um, you got your temperature in the X and, and height on the Y. So now you've got this surface that has cooled and the adjacent air right above it has also cooled compared to the air above it and you get this temperature inversion. And that's the beginning. Typically this begins really developing before sunset on a cold clear day, right? These processes are already taking place by late afternoon. So as long as the skies remain clear, that surface temperature will continue to cool the overlying air. That temperature will, inversion will continue to strengthen. And during a clear night, the surface temperature will be, will be cold, is always the coldest. It's coldest in the air above it. That layer is colder than the air above that. Now, don't think of these as separated air masses. We're just talking about temperature within that profile, okay? So more radiation is emitted from the surface than it's received from atmospheric radiation or heat that's conducted from the soil, okay? And air will continue to cool. More and more heat is conducted into that colder surface. Um, and that, that height of that cooler air, that cooled air layer will increase, okay? So this is the breakdown, the basic characteristics of an inversion. You've got your dense cooler air close to the surface. The less dense warmer air rises above, okay? So what we're looking at is the surface, the top of the inversion layer, this is the temperature profile. So the temperature is increasing with height. Within this, air, it, you know, because you, you've got the warmer, less dense air above, the surface is colder, you've got a very stable atmosphere. It restricts any vertical motion. You know, those tiny circulation cells, that convection is not happening. And because of that, then air within this layer 
can only really move one direction, which is horizontally. There's no vertical motion to disperse that, right? And that's the problem. That's the issues that we're talking about. That air can only move uh, in what we call laminar flow here. We could talk about the intensity defined by the difference in two temp you know, temperature at two different heights. That'll give you the intensity of the inversion. Uh, in Antarctica, it's pretty amazing. You can get temperature inversions of 20 degrees over the height of a human body. Okay, Very, very stable atmosphere where it could be minus 30 at your feet and minus 10 at your head, right? I mean, it, that's the intensity of those types of inversions. But here, you know, we're talking about certainly within you know, five to 10 degrees, we can see those types of inversions. Now on clear nights, you get the most intense version, inversion just after sunrise. Why is that? Because there's a lag. Once that sun comes above the horizon, there's a slight lag before that radiation is being absorbed into the Earth's surface. And so that's when you, you tend to get your strongest inversion just after sunrise. Okay. Now there's a couple of conditions to think about. What if it's windy, okay? So uh, wind speed typically is zero at the Earth's surface, and then it increases exponentially with height, okay? We've got a lot of obstructions at the surface. We've got friction, right? Friction just because of the surface itself. So the wind speeds are zero at the surface, and they increase exponentially with height. Now, taking our clear morning again with no wind, those convection cells are gonna <laughs> gradually grow larger and larger. And then by late afternoon or late morning, mixing some air turbulence between the warmer air and the cooler air will lead to kind of like the light, gusty, variable direction winds near the surface. Now, if you've got light winds, by mid-afternoon, this is the green curve that your temperature profile is likely to be, right? So hopefully not us sitting at 105, but this is just an example here where the surface is very warm, decreases rapidly with height, that's a non-inversion situation, right? So we're talking about non-inversion, daytime clear skies. Now, during windy, so by mid to late afternoon, the sun is setting, right? Those convection cells will weaken, those puffy clouds start to dissipate and, and slowly evaporate, and the wind speeds will decrease sometimes to zero, right? Now, um, during windy conditions, all of those Changes in topography or obstructions cause these, causing these random chaotic swirling motions, which we call turbulent flow, help wind change rapidly with direction and speed. And because of the windy conditions, what's happening is um, the air, that, that cooler air above and the warmer air near the surface, they're being mixed a little bit more, right? So the profile during a windy day might be like this, where, yeah, temperatures are still decreasing with height, but the decrease is much, much slower because that warmer and cooler air have mixed throughout the atmosphere. That's the impact of wind during the day, right? And I start there because then we wanna to go to nighttime, right? So what about windy conditions at night? Now, if we've got a typical inversion scenario where our temperatures are coldest at the surface, they warm with height, those eddies, again, that windy, those windy conditions, those eddies and turbulent motion, Again, we'll mix that air, right? Replace that slower moving, colder air that's, that's near the surface with the warmer air aloft. And that profile here, where we have this strong inversion on a windy night, that's really perturbed, right? Because the surface isn't able to cool as much and it's cooler aloft because the, the, the or cooler aloft because that warmer air is being circulated and mixed. And so, as our wind speeds increase, inversion strength are stead that's steadily weakened, right? And, and if you've got, you know, a, a four, five, six mile per hour, maybe you have a weak inversion. But some of these things, you know, some of the inversions can be stable up to about four or five miles per hour, right? So there, there, there's some evidence to show that, that they can be quite stable. But in the windiest cases, you know, even in the windiest cases, the surface, uh, the surface is often cooler uh, because it's continually, you know, um, it's continuously cooling and giving off that terrestrial radiation on a clear night.
Uh, so wind, if it's a windy condition, that'll tend to weaken or, or even destroy an inversion if the wind is strong enough. Okay? Now what about clouds? We talked about clear skies earlier in, in, the, in the impact of water vapor and carbon dioxide to absorb the emitted radiation from the Earth's surface and then emit back toward the surface. But th when we've got clouds, which are water droplets and ice crystals, they absorb, they reflect, they emit radiation, right? So the greater the cloud cover, the more that solar radiation coming into the Earth's surface will be reflected back to space or absorbed by the clouds, okay? And all of that terrestrial radiation that's being emitted from Earth's surface and emitted back into the space is going to be absorbed by those clouds and then emitted back toward the surface. So what is that going to do with that balance of energy when you've got clouds, say, on a, on a, on a, during the nighttime, right? That energy that's been absorbed from the surface to the cloud is going to be emitted back down. So the greater the cloud cover, it causes slower surface cooling and can slow the, the formation of temperature inversions from the late afternoon or evening. So if you've got a cloudy sky in the afternoon, it's really gonna slow down that surface cooling and slow down that process of temperature inversions developing. So if you're looking for some weather conditions in the, in, during the afternoon or late afternoon, if it's overcast, it's likely that the inversions are gonna be very difficult to form because of that radiation being emitted back to the surface that keeps the surface from, from cooling as rapidly. Uh, when you deal with partly to mostly cloudy skies, well, really you need instruments, right? You need the measurements. You need to know what the temperature, if the temperature inversion is actually forming um, when you've got fewer clouds. Certainly the greater the cloud cover, the more likely inversions will be inhibited from, from developing. All right, so now we're going to take a, another little hard break here because Humidity and dew point, you know, humidity is, is part of the discussion. It's part of, of when, we, when we deal with these things uh, to think about. Now we've got, uh, oftentimes we, we talk about relative humidity. Uh, we like to use dew point temperature a little bit more, right? Because dew point is, is the temperature to which the air must be cooled for saturation to occur, okay? Versus relative humidity, which we're a little bit more in tune with, I think is, uh, you know, looking at weather forecast and stuff, it depends, it's a ratio, it's a percentage, right? A ratio of the amount of atmospheric moisture that's present to the amount that would be present if saturation were, were occurring. Now, why is this important? If somebody says it's 50% relative humidity today, is it comfortable? Is it uncomfortable? What about 50% humidity on July 14th? Is that comfortable? Or 60%, right? So it really depends. So, so there are three cylinders here. All three of them have a relative humidity of 50%. Each of these are representing different temperatures. So this one's at 55 degrees, this one's at 75, and this one's at 95. So relative humidity is 50% in all three, but the dew point temperature, 37, 55, and 74, right? So a temperature of 95 with a dew point of 74, I guarantee it's not comfortable for most of us, right? Even though relative humidity is the same as 55 with a dew point of 37, which is, which is a dry condition, right? Now, that's something to keep in mind as we move forward, and I'll show you on, on a couple of the weather maps here. So why is dew point, invers you know, why is dew point imp important for inversions? Well, the lower the dew point, by its definition means, you have less water vapor in the atmosphere to absorb that radiation that's coming off the surface, that terrestrial radiation, and then to emit it back toward the surface. So relatively dry air, when we have dry air, it means more of that terrestrial radiation is lost to space. And the surface can cool very rapidly. We've all experienced this. Clear afternoon, we get to the evening, that sun goes down and those temperatures drop fast, right? If it's really dry, all of that emitted radiation is just being lost to space. And when we have cool, you know, drier air, inversions tend to form very rapidly and they're often more intense because of that loss of the terrestrial radiation. Now, say upper canopy leaves, if you're looking at the leaves on crops here, they will cool to the dew point temperature during the clear, calm night. 
And that water vapor, remember the definition, it's to the condensation, saturation occurs. And then dew will form on those leaf surfaces, right? If it's below freezing, we'll get, we'll get the frost. And it's just an indication that, of that rapid development here and that loss of the terrestrial radiation. So dew or frost deposition is a warning that it's likely or, or could that the, the inversion may exist. So that's something else to think about. If you've got dew sitting on the leaves, that, that's an, uh, uh, that an inversion conditions existing. Now, as far as the process goes, as the surface continues to cool, that overlying air, right, continues to cool through conduction as well. And eventually condensation occurs in the atmosphere, right? And what happens? We get fog. Fog develops because we've reached that saturation point. And often dew or frost will appear well before the fog develops. So what's that mean in practical terms? Is that if you've got the presence of fog, it almost nearly always indicates that an inversion condition existed prior to the fog formation. Right? That's important. That fog means that that inversion has intensified, that cooling of that surface air closer to the surface. So if you have fog, it's likely the inversion already formed and, and evaporation could be tough, but horizontal movement with light winds is possible. Awesome. There's a lot of details and a lot of stuff about radiation and movement of energy, right? Let's put it into practical terms and, and kind of look at an experiment. And again, I want to thank uh, Jim DeGrand for, for providing the data here. They looked at uh, temperatures at, in the atmosphere, five different levels, uh, and then m multiple soil levels for a period of two weeks. And uh, so what we've got is this dark curve here is a time series from September 12th to the 13th of temperature at the surface. And then our atmospheric measurements are at a half meter, one meter, two meter, four meter, and eight meters, okay? And then we've got three other soil temperatures at 10 centimeter, 20, and 30 centimeters. So let's put all of these pieces back together, right, based on this graph. And again, we're going to start here, which is at close to sunrise on September 12th. So sunrise, that energy is being absorbed at the surface. And what's that surface doing? That surface temperature is going to increase, increase, increase. And so you see this very rapid rise, right, in the surface temperature here during the morning hours. Now the dark color is closest to that surface. It's at a half meter. And then the lighter, lightest color is eight meters away, right? So eventually what do you see here? A few hours after sunrise, you've got your warmest temperature at the surface. Your next highest level in the atmosphere at a half meter is the next warmest, and so on. So you have cooling with height. You have that situation. It's not an inversion. You've got cooling with height, right? So then you reach our solar noon, and then shortly after that, you get that peak in the surface. And very rapidly, as the sun goes down, what's happening to that temperature surface? The surface, the temperature at the surface. It's already cooling, right? It's rapidly cooling. Even though the high temperature for the day, which we typically measure at around two meters, right, is occurring simultaneously as that surface is starting to cool. Remember that lag that's happening in the atmosphere. So here you go. You start to cool very rapidly. And then through that process of the heat conduction from that warmer atmosphere to the cooler surface, you get the inversion that forms. And that, that occurs about right here around 1900. And then you can see throughout the nighttime here, where the temperature at the surface is cooler than the subsequent air level, the levels of the atmosphere above it, right? That's, this is the inversion time. And the eight meter wind speed at the end of this inversion was zero miles per hour, okay? So I think this, this graph nicely shows the time series of those processes taking place from the absorption of the solar radiation at the surface, the conduction into the atmosphere above it, uh, that starts to warm the surface. As the sun deep goes down, then the surface is cooling. Our temperatures then start to cool, and then the heat from the atmosphere is being conducted into the surface, but the terrestrial radiation is still being lost, and we have our inversion present that night. Pretty, pretty fascinating, right? So what we can do is we can take two different uh, time steps here. This is at 2 p.m. in the afternoon when the surface is warm. And then I, I pulled midnight from this and create vertical profiles of the temperature just to show that the vertical profile or the temperature here with height is very different between 2 p.m. and midnight. So which one's the inversion? 
the blue curve, right? So that's the one that happened at midnight. This was the curve at 2 p.m. when we had no inversion. Surface was warmer and it cools with height. So basically, inversions are, are nocturnal. They occur around sunset or just really prior to, as I, I alluded to before. And they break up right after, soon after sunrise. Windy and cloudy conditions are going to inhibit those development, right? But it only takes a small amount of that mechanical mixing, or once that sun comes up and starts striking the surface, that conduction process is, is initiated, okay? So this is the example from, from Waterman Farm, and I'll have one more thing to say about that as we move forward here. Yeah. That, that night, that was a clear night. Yeah, clear night. Um, I should have I should have grabbed, I mean, the intensity here you see, uh, if you go eight meters to the surface, it's 15 degrees, right? That's pretty strong. I, that's a clear night. There's no, no doubt about it. that's a clear night. So we're, we're talking close to 75 degrees and 60 degrees at the surface. I mean, eight meters, it, it's up there, but 20, 20 feet or so, 25 feet or so, right? All right. So that's kind of the science behind it, and hopefully you understand a little bit more about how they form. But I also want to give some information about decision making and what information you can use to help drive some of the decisions that you want to make. So what I've done is I've done an analysis using hourly observations from around the state. Um, ideally, I would want higher frequency data, like five minute averages, which is what uh, the turf grass example was. But I wanted to look at, you know, kind of the hourly climatology. It doesn't match right with our, our, um, our, current climate normal period of 81 to 2010, but I'm looking at the last 30 years, at all the stations that are possible, and honestly, a couple of these I had to fill in that don't go back to 1988 on an hourly basis. But we've got five regions here, the Northwest, the Northeast, which probably have one or two many stations here, the Southwest, Southeast, and Central region, okay? And we're gonna look at the, the wind data, and, and from a climatological standpoint, can that help us, help you make some decisions? So here are the first couple of graphs and how all of these work. The springtime, excuse me, the springtime is in blue. The summertime are in the red colors. Uh, March being the darkest, June being the darkest, summer. And for every hour of the day, and these are going to go from 8 p.m. Uh, to 7 p.m. here. For every hour of the day, we have the 30-year climatological average of wind speed at that time. And I've also marked on here the 3 mile per hour and the 10 mile per hour demarcation, right, based on the labels and, and things that, that you're concerned about. So what we have is this is the northwest and this is the northeast uh, stations on average. And so they, they have similar wind speeds and wind speed patterns. Uh, most of the night you can see 8 p.m. till even 8 a.m., um, you know, where we have the weakest wind speeds and then a, a rapid increase in the afternoon. So to, to kind of help with some decisions, I said, okay, I'm going to make some assumptions here. I'm gonna assume that we have possible inversions during these, this period here, this block, and possible inversions, you know, 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. So uh, with, uh, 8 a.m. isn't too far-fetched here. I mean, it's really after sunrise when those things really start breaking down. And then I'm gonna use the May time series here, the light blue curve, and I'm gonna mark on here when wind speeds climb above, on average, above 10 miles per hour. So I've blocked that, that region off. And you can see on average across the Northwest then, that leaves a May window where you don't have an inversion likely and winds between three and 10 of about three hours. What's that? <laughs> right, so that's, a, that's gonna limit your time here. Uh, in the Northeast, it's four and a half hours on average. It's a little bit longer and you can pick your month. I mean, if you're looking at April, uh, we're at 10 miles per hour by 10 a.m. Right? So there, there are some decisions, and I think this can help overall when, when you're thinking about when's a good time I can I maybe plan on doing some of this stuff. This might, might help you out. Uh, a couple of other uh, regions here, the southwest and the central portion. Uh, you can see winds are a little bit lower in the central portion. Now, these aren't, I don't have all the ideal stations, obviously, and it's a limited number of stations. Uh, but you can see in the southwest and, and central here, Similar story, right? About three and a half hours in the southwest. And funny, and, and I think this is just because of the stations I picked, which were Rickenbacker, John Glenn, and Fairfield County. 
Fairfield County, as you'll see in a moment, is really driving this open window. If we use May as that 10 meter per, or 10 mile per hour time frame, it's a little bit longer here across the central region. Now we can we can look at these a, a little bit more urban versus rural setting, right? Which one do you think is the the rural setting? The one on the right. This is the Fairfield County versus the Columbus, right? At nighttime because of those lack of obstructions and things that are happening, those winds are really tanking out, right? So here in late summer, we don't get above three miles per hour until about 10 a.m., but we really don't eclipse that 10 mile per hour mark. So that's a pretty big window, a bigger window here in Fairfield County versus Columbus. What is all of this to say? It's really site specific, right? It really can come down to the different sites that you're located and, and needing those, those types of measurements in terms of wind measurements uh, when you're wanting to apply. One last example here is lakeside versus inland. We're, uh, we're in the northeast, right? But which one's the lakeside versus inland? That's Cleveland, and this is in Tuscarora, the Harry Cleaver Field, right? Very weak wind speeds. Wind speeds aren't as strong during the daytime like they are in, in Cleveland. All right, but that's a climatological look. You guys know wind doesn't look like that, right? It doesn't look like that. Wind looks like this, okay? This is um, the wind speeds during the first week of May of 2017 over here on West Campus, um, but it, it, it gets the point across. These are one minute averages of wind speeds, okay? Based on 10 second data. So there's 10, every 10 seconds taken a measurement of wind speed. And you can see they're highly variable. This is just the first week, right? One minute averages in the gray. Again, that three and that 10 mile per hour is marked out here. And if I look at the hourly averages, even during periods that fall within that three to 10 mile per hour threshold, you're still getting spikes of 10, 15, 20 miles per hour, right? That's what wind really looks like on one minute averages versus hourly average. And it would be even more chaotic if I looked at a 10 second average, right? So that's also something to remember and kind of speaks to having those infield measurements as we go along. One other thing I think would help uh, that, that, that applicators and others could use is to kind of understand the general wind regimes in your location. So I'm, I'm picking Finley here, Ohio, to do a couple of examples with. Uh, and what we can create are, are wind roses. We call them wind roses, uh, which essentially will provide you the frequency that the wind blows from a certain direction at a certain magnitude. And for Finley, I'm just looking at the May just all of the Mays between 88 and 2017. And what do you see? You see predominantly southerly, south-southwesterly winds to the westerly direction and maybe another peak from the north-northeast when we get lows that slide to the south of Finley and you get that northeast or easterly wind, right? But what, what I think this would help is, you know, if you're aware, as Jared's gonna talk about the registry, if you're aware of those that are around you, these predominant wind speeds could really help in terms of a decision making of you know looking at the primary direction and then also you know anything above that light green that's a large you know two five maybe six percent of the time where winds are above 10 miles per hour blowing out of that direction during may and if you add all of those up you start to limit that time right you start to limit that period so with a little inspiration from mark laux who, who a weed specialist there with extension I decided to look at Finley for May of 2017. Now, honestly, last May probably wasn't the best example, probably extreme, very wet spring, as you recall. But if you take May 2017, we have 744 hourly observations during the month, okay? Now, of those 744, 389 of them, or about 52%, occurred when winds were greater than 10 miles per hour. Another 29, about 4%, winds were below three miles per hour. Okay, so we're, we're blocking those out. Now measurable precipitation fell on 14 of the 31 days. Okay, so that means out of the 18 days, you had either had precipitation falling or forecast to fall. So if I take that, of that remaining 326 hourly observations left, within three to 10 miles per hour, 23% of that, of the total, weren't available because of precip, 173 more hours. And out of the remaining 153 hours, only 54, 7% occur after sunrise or before sunset. 
Okay. So I think, again, this is one station. This is probably an extreme in terms of precipitation, but it's something to think about in the decisions that you got to make and, and when, when it's going to be good to apply, right? Uh, Ohio's got some challenges when it comes to precip and when, right? The other thing is to look at, you know, the, the topic of volatility and temperatures. And I'm not going to spend as much time here because if you look climatologically speaking, uh, you know, temperatures during the summer, even at the warmest, are averaging around the mid 80s, right, on an hourly basis. This is middle of the afternoon here. And obviously there, there's concerns with, with the formulas and, and, and the volatility and such. But the one thing I did with temperatures is I looked at three different stations and I just said, okay, what are the average number of hours per month that that station has a temperature that is higher or lower than certain thresholds. So you're gonna see from March through August, um, in 80 to 90, 91 to 100, and 101 to 110, for a Northwest, Central, and Southwest region. So if we target May here, on average, we're looking at maybe, you know, less than an hour on average where Finley would be above 91 degrees, okay? about an hour here in the central. And of course it gets a lot higher later in the summer, but there's a lot of other restrictions happening in the summer as well. So what's this to say? It's really episodic. And again, having instruments, having measurements that are at the site to know exactly what the temperature are, temperatures are is key here. But from a large scale decision-making, there's not a lot of really strong evidence to drive, I think, on the volatility and temperature, okay? So let's, let's review and put it all together here. So this was at Farm Science Review last year, inversion present here. So clear skies, you're gonna get your temperature inversions. These are some clues to keep in mind. Clear skies, calm winds, generally less than three miles per hour. Uh, dew present is a good indication, right, that, that the inversion has formed. And certainly when fog is there, it's intensified. Now I mentioned earlier, we, we, we had this process called dro uh, cold air drainage, which is really neat. You, you, I know you've seen it in the fields when there are certain areas where it's a lower terrain, that cold air under calm winds, it'll settle, it's dense, it settles down into those valleys and that form, that fog forms really readily. Interestingly enough, Jim shared with me a story of the turf grass. And you know, in the afternoon when you got clear skies and those temperatures decrease and they decrease to zero, and that inversion has formed, then all of a sudden in the data, you see a shift in the wind direction, right? A little bit more westerly, a little uptick in wind, certainly like one or two miles per hour, but a shift in the wind direction. And it's believed that that particular station, after the inversions formed and you've got horizontal laminar flow, that cold air is draining toward the Olentangy Valley, right? The Olentangy River Basin because you get that, so you can get that small shift in wind direction that's opposite, say, or in a different direction of the prevailing winds during the day. Because a lot of times we're gonna see those south, southerly or southwesterly winds. So that's something to keep in mind after that inversion forms as well. So dew, fog, uh, horizontal smoke patterns. A couple other things to keep in mind. You know, when you're dealing with closed crop canopies, I mean, if you've got crops, it's going to behave a little bit different than bare soil, right? That, those crops have low heat capacity, so they're not really receiving heat from leaves that are underneath. And they tend to, form, they tend to cool very rapidly. So your inversions tend to form sooner and are more intense over closed crop canopies than they are on bare soil because of that heat exchange difference. And you can also think about areas that are behind shelter or windbreaks the more you decrease that possibility of wind, that area is likely to see inversions form a little bit more readily. So these are some other things to keep in mind as we move forward. So if you get up in the morning and you're looking at a map, a weather map, uh, this might be a situation here that, that you look at. So I, I pulled one, this is June 2nd of 2017. So we've got um, what we call synoptic conditions or the, these larger scale conditions over the region. We've got high pressure really centered over the Ohio Valley. Uh, fronts aren't really close by, and this leads to what we call large-scale subsidence, meaning that the air is sinking over this region. It inhibits cloud development, right? Winds tend to be really light, and so this is a weather map that, that could say, you know what, These are, this is a condition that might lend itself to an inversion. So in Columbus, we had a high of 82 that day, 
And in the middle of the afternoon, our dew point was 41 with a relative humidity of 23%. Bingo, it was dry, dry atmosphere. It's gonna cool rapidly. We dropped to 53 that night. So at night, the surface cools, rapid development of the inversion. So that's a pattern to keep in mind. And I think you really tune in on these high pressure areas, right? The next one, September 12th at, from the turf grass. This was the, uh, the, the pattern in the setup. High pressure was a little bit farther east here, but we were generally under the effect of high pressure. In between fronts, light winds, lack of clouds, no precip. Turf grass temperature of 80. Dew point in the middle of the afternoon of 53 with the relative humidity of 40%. 40% dry air inversion, right? The other thing to keep in mind, if you look at these maps, th these lines connect areas of equal pressure. And when they're spaced far apart like that, that means you're, you're light, you have light winds, the winds are light. Versus when you get close to the cold front, you can see they're stacked a little closer. The winds are, are gonna be stronger close to those fronts and those isobars will really help you out. Then the last one, this was last May. The night before this warm front that's well up into Canada here was shifting through Northern Ohio. So this is Finley 88. Now that low temperature that night was only 74. Uh, the night before it was 65. So maybe there's an inversion this day. Certainly the isobars are a little bit closer together. So the winds are gonna be a little bit higher, but there was some, you know, dry air, 31% relative humidity. You know, a temperature of 88 with a dew point of 54, it's still comfortable, it's dry heat, right? Um, but, but essentially, but again, that high pressure sitting out in the Atlantic, really keeping, you know, the possibility of clear skies or partly cloudy skies here. Uh, so that's another, another thing to key in on. So with that, I'll go ahead and I'll wrap up um, acknowledgements and some reference material. Again, uh, thanks to Jim DeGrand. Uh, a lot of this information uh, from this online, from the North Dakota State University, uh, an excellent read and some more information there on inversions. And then there's a lot of activity that's happening uh, in, throughout the region, I would say, throughout the Midwest. Uh, hopefully soon, sooner rather than later, we can maybe start monitoring these on a more active basis uh, and, and help the state out for sure. So with that, uh, thank you. And I think we've got a couple minutes for questions. Yes, if anyone here has questions or folks that are um, tuning in, they can type in their questions and we'll ask them. So if you give, give me a minute, I'll bring the microphone over so the whole world can hear the question. The wind speeds we're using, was those at 10 meters? Yeah. And, and how would that affect at our spraying heights of approximately two feet? Right, so that, that is why um, we don't have ideal measurements in terms of widespread across the state. So obviously we're gonna need those wind measurements at that spray height. Um, again, thinking that the wind speeds generally will, will be closer to zero close to the surface and they decrease or increase with height, uh, that's another thing to keep in mind. But, but all of those stations certainly were at 10 meters uh, on the hourly observations that we were using. Um, I, Hey, do yeah, we have another to, question here? I'll, I'll finish up, I'll come up to you. With the current concerns over the dicamba drift, do you suppose that the National Weather Service or some of the other web-based weather forecasting will come up with a forecast for inversions per, per certain area of a region? Say like they forecast fog the evening before you'd go to bed, will there be possible inversion forecasts mm. added to those websites? I can't speculate on what the National Weather Service was do, would do, but that's essentially what the, the State Climate Office and the offices around the region are wanting to do. So we have instrumentation that we can, we can hopefully we'll start putting some of these instruments on uh, some sites that, that we have um, that will help us determine inversion potential. A little bit more closely. We don't have, you know, turf grass was a two week experiment with all of these various instrumentations. Right now, we haven't had it within the capacity of the state to put that all together. The other thing is, you're talking about, talking about forecast in the microclimate that varies widely across the state. I'm not sure what the National Weather Service is going to do, but it's a target of the state climate office. This is something that we want to help folks with to at least have an idea hey, 
we're, you're going in tonight with an, a pretty strong inversion potential. Uh, so you really need to be cautious. So there are efforts underway, and there's a lot of players coming to the table locally and, and across the region. Yeah. Um, you were saying that with drier, I understand why with drier air at sunset, that's one of the factors because you get more heat transfer from the surface if the air is dry. But is there a certain relative humidity or a certain dew point where you can say an inversion is much less likely? Can that be one way of predicting? Oh, uh, <laughs> that's a tricky question. Um, no, because it's all, I mean, both of those are relative, right? I mean, your dew point is never going to be higher than your temperature. Right, so the closer the dew point is to your temperature, the more saturated you are. Uh, but to but to put a specific label on it, you know, again, ninety. Mm, you, you probably see a lot of the graphs in terms of human comfortability, right? Where dew points in the fifties are comfortable, I would say that's a dry at, a dry atmosphere. Dew points in the fifties, dew points in the sixties means it's sticky. Uh, dew points in the seventies are pretty muggy, right? And we've, we've hit a dew point of 80 in Columbus for a few minutes, historically, essentially. I mean, and that's a tremendous amount of water that's in the atmosphere. To say that there's a certain dew point where inversions will or will not form, not without considering the winds, not considering the site, the sheltering, what kind of crops bear soil, I think it's really gonna be dependent. But the general idea is the lower the dew point uh, difference compared to your temperature, the drier the air, and the more likely the inversions will form very quickly. So I know, I know it doesn't really satisfy your question, but I don't think I'd be willing to say 55 dew points going to give you an inversion. That's going to be very difficult. I don't know. Do you, do you think? No. I want to verify two things I thought I heard you say. Yeah. During an inversion, the uh, volatility will tend to move downhill into a valley. So if we've got a grape arbor that's at a lower elevation, it's much more likely to get hit than if it's one on a mountain. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. Because, I mean, when you're talking about within that inversion layer, you've, you've stabilized any vertical motion. So you're not really going to be able to push anything higher altitude. That what we call cold air drainage it typically kicks in or that, that drainage, that colder air is more, it's heavy, it's dense, and it's going to sink into the lower lower elevated regions and so certainly the, the condition anything that's existing in at lower you know lower topography is going to be more susceptible than something that's higher topography yeah yeah and then if i understood you right again the the weather stations are measuring wind speeds at 30 feet off the ground yes so correct. and typically that's lower wind speeds are lower at the surface correct correct that's really important. Absolutely. And that's very precise. Instead of some days where the well, National Weather Service is telling us we shouldn't be spraying, but we're getting by with it because it's not windy where we are. Yeah, and, and 10 meters, 10 meters, I mean, you're talking most of the time, that's the top of the inversion layer, or at least close to it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, anywhere where you can, again, I think the best practice is to have measurements where you're spraying so that you know precisely what the wind speeds are um, in terms of the wind, but there's a lot that you can do to identify the inversions as well, and you'll know that they're, they're lighter wind speeds, lower, or lower altitude. Yeah. Okay, we have time for one more question. This may not be directed at you or someone in the room, but are any efforts being made with the formulations or other things you can add to the tank mixes to dicamba, stickers, something along that nature that's decreasing the volatility without decreasing the effectiveness in the field. That may not, you're, you're the weather guy. Yeah. Is that need to go more to the chemistry guy? Is he on deck? <laughs> okay, we're gonna give that take, question to Matt, Matt Beal with answer. Ohio Department of Agriculture. Yeah, these new formulas, they have what our uh, lab director has explained to us as somewhat of a gumming agent. And there's several different gumming agents in there. They were hoping that those agents would stick the dicamba to the plant and lower the volatility, which they. Yeah. 
Ryan, do you remember the slide that they had as far as the volatility from true dicamba to the clarity formula to Yeah, there is a slide in their training programs that addresses that issue, both BASF and Monsanto's, I know, and I'm assuming DuPont's does as well. Some things that are not because they further the volatility. Yes. Well, there, are, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't have much voice this morning, but on the label of extended max infectant and uh, these dicamba products, there are deposition agents that you must use that have been cleared by EPA and everybody. Um, to get the spray down to the target. Uh, but there are also additives that you cannot use because they increase the volatility, uh, whether they have ammonium ions in them or whatever. Um, you cannot use, say, ammonium sulfate, you know, if you put Roundup with your extended max, for example, because it will nullify. The, um, the agents that make the dicamba product actually, um, I want to say, uh, less volatile or, you know, it increases the volatility if you use those things. So, but all this is on the label, you know. Go ahead and let Matt have um, one more word. And in many cases, the labels want to refer you to their websites to look at the tank mixes. Um, we do have all the slide decks from the online training and the in-person training um, for all the registrants of the new ICAMBA formulations. And they have some really good slides in there on the micron size of the droplet and how that reacts from the boom height to when it hits the actual target area. So you might want to take a look at that if you haven't, but they, the label does refer you to the website for additional information of just what the gentleman was talking about. Okay, unfortunately we need to get on to the next talk. Um, if you have more inversion questions, Aaron will be around um, afterwards and then we'll have his contact information on the website if folks have other questions.